Uh, all right, we've done Poe, we've done Whitman. We're going to stay in America and stay in the 19th century. The following, yeah, it appeared on August 14th, uh, 1888 in the San Francisco Examiner. The author was Ernest Lawrence Thayer, not a name most of us know, uh, and he didn't think much of the piece, but has become part of American folklore and by popular request and undue pressure on the live bard. <laughs> We're going to do Casey at the back. Time. How darn time, said Frank. I was going to make, I had to make it suffer a little bit. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood two to four with but one inning more to play. And then when he died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go, leaving there the rest who clung to hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could get a whack at that, they'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Finn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, though much disguised, then tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and all saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hug and third. Then from five thousand throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on face, Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his cap. No stranger in the crowd could doubt. Twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him. As he rubbed his hands with dirt, five thousand tongues applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there, close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of a storm waves on a stern and distant store. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone in the stands. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He singled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, an echo added fraud. But one scornful look from Casey and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let the ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Oh. Oh. So last year I did this one, and I said, "Well, I won't do these this year," and, I th and that was not acceptable. I have to, I have to do this. So I'm going to do this one again. Casey's Revenge by James Wilson. There were saddened hearts in Mudville. For a week or even more, there were murmured oaths and curses. Every fan in town was sore. 
Just think, said one, how soft it looked, with Casey at the bat, and then to think he'd go and spring a bush league trick like that. All his past fame was forgotten. He was now a hopeless shine. They called him Strike Out Casey, from the mare on down the line. And as he came to bat each day, his bosom heaved a sigh, while a look of hopeless fury shone in mighty Casey's eye. The lane is long, someone has said, that never turns again, and fate, though fickle, often gives another chance to men. And Casey smiled, his rugged face no longer wore a frown. The pitcher who had started all the trouble came to town. All Mudville had assembled. 10,000 fans had come to see the twirler who had put big Casey on the bum. And when he stepped onto the mound, the multitude went wild. He doffed his cap in proud disdain. But Casey only smiled. Play ball, the umpire's voice rang out, and then the game began. But in the throng of thousands, there was not a single fan who thought that Mudville had a chance. And with the setting sun, their hopes sank low. The rival team was leading four to one. The last half of the ninth came round with no change in the score. But when the first man up hit safe, the crowd began to roar. The din increased, the echo of 10,000 shouts with heard, when the pitcher hit the second and gave four balls to the third. Three men on base, nobody out. Three runs to tie the game. A triple meant the highest niche in Midville's Hall of Fame. Ah, but here the rally ended, and the gloom was deep as night when the fourth one fouled the catcher, and the fifth flew out to right. A dismal groan and chorus came. A scowl was on each face when Casey walked up, bat in hand, and slowly took his place. His bloodshot eyes in fury gleamed. His teeth were clenched in hate. He gave his cap a vicious hook and pounded on the plate. But fame is fleeting as the wind and glory fades away. There were no wild and woolly cheers, no glad acclaim this day. They hissed and groaned and hooted as they clamored, strike him out. But Casey gave no outward sign that he had heard the shout. The pitcher smiled and cut one loose across the plate it spread. Another hiss, another groan, strike one, the umpire said. Zip, like a shot, the second curve broke just below his knees. Strike two, the umpire roared aloud. But Casey made no plea. No roasting for the umpire now, his was an easy lot. But here the pitcher whirled again. Was that a rifle shot? A whack, a crack, and out through space, the leather pellet flew, a blot against the distant sky, a speck against the blue. Above the fence in center field in rapid whirling fight, the sphere stayed on, the blot grew dim, and then was lost to sight. 10,000 hats were thrown in air. 10,000 threw a fit and no one ever found the ball that mighty Casey hit. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, dark clouds may hide the sun, and somewhere bands no longer play, and children have no fun. And somewhere over blighted lives, there hangs a heavy pall, but Mudville hearts are happy now for Casey hit the ball. Yay! Casey here. At the risk of wearing out my welcome, we have the baseball trifecta tonight. A poem that I have not done. In fact, I've never, I've never performed this poem before an audience. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, a few words. 
pallor, uh, a natural paleness from fear, the phrase, two pitchers in a field, and I'm tempted to say, well, the only thing pitchers are good for is throwing a fastball. But if you want them to run and you want them to hit, you know, at least historically, they, uh, mutt, not a dog, but a simpleton. Uh, to get spiked, I, as a uh, kid, used to wear half-inch metal spikes on the bottom of my cleats. And if you got spiked, you knew you were in for it. Uh, break a thumb, a real, realistic proposition. As a 12-year-old, I was a catcher. And, I, the, you know, major leagues, the balls can almost get up to 100 miles an hour, over occasionally. But I mean, that sucker's got to be going at least 60 miles an hour when a 12-year-old when a is throwing a ball at you. Anyway, uh, imbued means infused, and dub means to award a, fish and a, a, a facetious title. I will tell you the story of this later, because this takes place in Bugville, supposedly. The Bugville team was surely up against a rocky game. The chances were they'd win defeat and not undying fame. Three men were hurt and two were benched. The score stood six to four. They had to make three hard-earned runs in just two innings more. It can't be done, the captain said, the pallor on his face. I've got two pitchers in the field, a mutt on second base. And should another man get spiked or crippled in some way, the team would sure be down and out with eight men left to play. We're up against it anyhow, as far as I can see. My boys ain't hitting like they should, and that's what worries me. The luck is with the other side. No pennant will we win. It's mighty tough, but we must take our medicine and grin. The eighth round opened, one, two, three, the enemy went down. The Bugville boys went out the same. The captain wore a frown. The first half of the ninth came round. Two men had been put out. When Bugville's pitcher broke a thumb, and could not go the route. A deathly silence settled o'er the crowd assembled there. Defeat would be allotted them. They felt it in the air. With only eight men in the field, would be a gruesome fray. Small wonder that the captain cursed the day he learned to play. Lend me a man to finish with, he begged the other team. Lend you a man, the foe replied. My boy, you're in a dream. We came to win the pennant too. That's what we're doing here. There's only one thing you can do, call for a volunteer. The captain stood and pondered in a listless sort of way. He never was a quitter and would not be one today. <clears throat> Is there within the grandstand here, his voice rang loud and clear, a man who has the sporting blood to be a volunteer? Again, that awful silence settled o'er the multitude. Was there among them with such recklessness imbued? The captain stood with cap in hand, while hopeless was his glance. And then a tall and stocky man cried out, I'll take a chance. Into the field he bounded with a step both firm and light. Give me the mask and mitt, he said. Let's finish up the fight. The game is now beyond recall. I'll last at least a round. Although I'm ancient, you will find me muscular and sound. His hair was sprinkled here and there with little streaks of gray. Around his eyes and on his brow, a bunch of wrinkles lay. The captain smiled despairingly and slowly turned away. Why, he's all right. One rooter yelled. Another, let him play. All right, go on, the captain sighed. The stranger turned around, took off his coat and collar too, and threw them on the ground. The humor of the situation seemed to hit them all, and as he donned the mask and mitt, the umpire cried, play ball. Three balls the pitcher at him hurled, three balls of lightning speed. The stranger caught them all with ease and did not seem to heed. Each pitch has been pronounced a strike, the side had been put out. 
And as he walked in toward the bench, he heard the rooter shout. One bugbill boy went out on strikes, and one was killed at first. The captain saw them fail to hit and gnashed his teeth and cursed. The third man smashed a double and the fourth man swatted clear. Then in the thunder of applause up came the volunteer. His feet were planted in the earth. He swung a warlike club. The captain saw his awkward pose and softly whispered, Dub. The pitcher looked at him and grinned, then heaved a mighty ball, the echo of that fearful swat still lingers with us all. High, fast, and far the spheroid flew, it sailed and sailed away, it ne'er was found, so it supposed it still floats on today. Three runs came in. The pennant would be Bugville's for a year. The fans and players gathered round to cheer the volunteer. What is your name? The captain asked. Tell us your name, cried all. As down his cheeks, great tears of joy were seen to run and fall. For one brief moment, he was still, then murmured soft and low, I mighty Casey, who struck out those 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, and I didn't tell you, is, is uh, Casey 20 years later, written in 1908, exactly 20 years after the original Casey had been produced. Thank you. Thank you very much.